the work and touched them. Yeah. Actually, I think probably I don't need this true. Yeah. Even better. It comes with volume and size. Pavarotti does that stuff too. Um, right, I thought today what I wanted to talk about is, you know, now that yeah, I've been here, I guess it seems for some I've been here forever, but I've only been here a little over a year. And, um, we have the revolution in humanities and social sciences and making the curriculum relevant to I squared E. And several people realize we spent 315 pages and killed about 300 trees over the past several months coming up with a curriculum reform doing just that. So I wanted to explain how it is that someone in humanities and social sciences, I prefer the humanities itself, but I have to defend the entire department, <laughs> views I squared E. And I would argue that, just because I like to have fights, that we do it better than anyone else. <laughs> as Publica Literaria or the Academy. Because we're trained to look at how creativity and genius were defined throughout history. Creativity and genius have histories. That is to say, how we define them now is not the way necessarily in which they were defined, to pick a year not randomly, 1791, right? So I'm interested in the ways in which creativity gets defined, genius gets defined, and the context in which that that, that intuitive thinking and that innovation and creation is fostered. Um, and so that's basically the talk, looking at history and philosophy of science and technology and I square E, looking at machines and humans, since that's near and dear to my heart. Um, in particular, with the notion of creativity and genius, I was always struck and fascinated by two forms of knowledge. And that leads really to the social sciences as well. There's the knowledge of the savant, of the scholar who reads Latin, who has funny glasses, who wears you know these kind of cheap suits because we're poor, um, and who has a certain way of viewing the earth and the world and relies upon print culture. The other knowledge is the knowledge of the craftsman, of the tinkerer, in German the Handwerker. And that's, that form of knowledge always fascinated me as well because it's not about print culture. Often Handwerker, particularly in the 19th century and earlier, did not write down what they do. Many of them couldn't write. Many of them, because of trade secrets, didn't, wouldn't want to write information down. It was an oral tradition. It was a tradition of master and apprentice. And I'm interested in the ways in which, historically, these two types of epistemologies, which is just a very sexy way for philosophers to say which knowledge, how we understand the world around us, our epistemology, how these two forms of knowledge interacted. At times, they were antithetical. And a lot of my story today is about that. And so what I want to invite you all to do because I'm going to be, you know, rather scandalous, is to say what is the relationship of I squared and A? I squared E is our motto, right? It's an important one, but historically it was I squared versus E in very interesting ways. And I want to map out that trajectory. Part of that battle in the 18th century is a battle about social class. Like my father was a weaving mechanic, right? He didn't go past the seventh grade. And he always said, you don't want to do what it is I do, you better go to university. And so I was always fascinated about how it was he communicated his knowledge and how I couldn't put together Mr. Potato Head Man when I was a kid, still can, but he could, right? And like I said, he didn't really read past the seventh grade, but he had other forms of knowledge that I sure as heck never had. And for those of you who saw me try to set up the computer, you know I probably never will have. So in a sense, that's what I'm, that's what I'm after. And in the beginning, since I, you know, in my introduction, I now work on molecular genetics, but in a previous life, I worked on physics. And when in doubt, because it's German stuff, you start with a manual count. It was a real cassette, it was hardly ever stable. I think I had a really dirty book, you drink it under the table. You know that one? Philosopher song, Monty Python? See, it's engineered. You gotta watch that song, it's great. Monty Python, Philosopher song. You know, a manual count is the beginning of a song, because a manual count really is the beginning of philosophy. Ask any German, Kurtz right there. Um, because he really has amazingly important things to say about genius and the role of genius. And interestingly enough, if you ask, if you were to, if we were to bring Kant from Königsberg, which isn't called that anymore because of wars, uh, what you know, which Naturwissenschaftler, scientist, we don't have the word scientist in English until 1837, would you consider a genius? He'd say, kind of, none of them. A scientist, in his view, was not a genius. Couldn't be a genius. An artist, Kunstler, however, was. And so he wrote he, this Critique de Urteilskraft, or the Critique of Judgment. It's the third critique. It came out in 1791, very influential work. If you haven't read him, read him. I know engineers can say, can we help build bridges with him? No, we're not going to help you build a bridge. We'll help you think. And that's one thing that philosophers are very, very good at, other than confusing the daylights out of you and making you fail papers. He was really great. 
For Kant, genius was a, was a capacity. Genius was a capacity by which nature gave the rule to art via the artist. The artist does not, does not follow rules. The, if you ask an artist, how is it that you created this beautiful piece of work, he or she could not tell you. It was a capacity, it was inspiration. It couldn't be reproduced. As a matter of fact, the whole notion is precisely that, that there is perhaps, there is, you know, there is a notion of creativity, genius, don't follow the rules. Rule following is what imitators do. And imitation, by Kant's definition, is failed genius. The other important bit of Kant, I mean, there are 53 billion, 597 million important things about Kant. We're just gonna talk about three of them. The second thing is, much like Aristotle, way before him, Kant reifies two distinct forms of art. One is aesthetic art, or if you speak German, you can also speak German because this is the best book we can live at Kunst right, is art. Aesthetic art is beauty because of the process in which it's done. It is not art for any kind of purpose other than the creation of something beautiful. It is not art to sell. That's important. It's not, it's not to have any purpose. It is a beautiful object in and of itself. That's aesthetic art. The antithesis for Kant is Handwerk, or craft art. Craft art is about making something for some particular reason, whether it's financial, whether it's utilitarian. For Kant, the only true art is aesthetic art. Why? Because only people who are free can do aesthetic art. People who are not free, meaning, what do I mean by free? People who need to earn a living have to create something that has a purpose. If you create something that has a purpose other than the, the creation of beauty itself, you're no longer free. That's a very old trope. It's Aristotelian, and it's very, very important in the 18th and 19th centuries in Europe, and also in the United States, when the Americans try to get away from that concept. So, liberal versus illiberal arts. There actually is a term. What does liberal mean? What does lib libba in Latin mean? Or liba in Latin? Free, not slave. That's liberal. Doesn't mean like a political thing where you know you're to the left of center. It does mean that too, but originally liber liberal means free. And so the idea was the liberal arts were the arts that free people did. Usually people who were wealthy enough that didn't need a job, but no, that's an important kind of class distinction. Uh, it was not mechanical by definition. The mechanical arts are not liberal arts. Um, it's not utilitarian. You can't ask what good, is, what good are they. Um, it's not specialized, because specialization restricts the human mind, according to Aristotle and according to Kant, right? Um, it's study for intrinsic values. It's not to earn a living. Germans have wonderful words. And there's a word, Brotstudium, which means bread study, which is not the study of bread, but literally the study in order to earn money so that you can eat. That's not aesthetic art. Right? That's craft for, for everyone involved. 